you describe for people the the sense of it, it, like you were one of the first people to point out the problems with the promotional material related to the COVID vaccines, that there was something inherent to the very nature of what they were propounding, aside from the fact we never really had a great track record of success of vaccines against coronaviruses because of something else you're mentioning, the nature of virus evolution. That the, the very in order for it to survive, it has to become more infectious, less lethal, and to some degree, it has to be able to circumvent the various mechanisms. So why the flu shot, you know, works only once every two years. Could you give some of that base? It's not like your everyday smallpox vaccine, for example. This is some, a very different virus, very different vaccine. Can you or so-called vaccine? Could you describe what the scientific issues are there? Sure. Uh, I will do my best. This is a complex topic and, you know, it'd be great to have uh, slides and a chalkboard and all of that. But um, let's start with the basics. Your immune system is elegantly built to recognize molecular structures that you yourself do not make. I won't go into the details about how that happens. It's among the most fascinating uh, set of facts in biology that I'm aware of. But nonetheless, you, after you uh, go through a certain amount of development, have what's called a self-non-self recognition system. You're, you do not react to molecules that you yourself make, and you react to almost any biological molecule that is not produced by you yourself on the presumption that those things are probably hostile. So that's the basics of the immune system, or at least the adaptive immune system. That system can be educated to react to a pathogen you have not yet seen by introducing antigens from that pathogen in one way or another. Antigens are molecular signatures that the immune system can learn to recognize. It can it literally evolves to recognize them better and better. So there are two general ways that that is done with what we classically call a vaccine. One way is to take a pathogen and to attenuate it so that it is not virulent. It does not make you sick, right? If we can give you a little infection that's closely related to some infection that is a threat to you, and we give you a mild version that doesn't make you especially sick, and most importantly, doesn't transmit from one person to the next, then we can give your immune system a trial run with something molecularly very similar to the dangerous disease. And then when you encounter the dangerous disease, your immune system is already educated. It has natural immunity because of cross-reactivity between the attenuated virus that we gave you and the wild virus that's a threat. Now, there are a number of reasons that vaccinologists don't prefer that method. For one thing, it's difficult to do, right? You want to get something that's good enough to give you enough of an infection to be capable of generating natural immunity, but you don't want it to get out of control. You don't want it to jump from person to person. So the point is you're, you're threading a needle with this mechanism. The best vaccines have this profile, but it's not an easy thing to arrange, and it takes a long time to figure out whether you've done it right. So you, from the point of view of the business of pharma, it's not a, a winner. We have figured out a way to cheat that is more uh, economically effective while being much less useful as a technique. And it basically involves dead viruses or fragments thereof, which have the molecular signature that your immune system is, has to learn. But the problem is the things that trigger your immune system to do the learning are the infection that is caused by the pathogen. If we inject some pieces of a virus into you, your body doesn't have the right reaction because you're not sick. And so it doesn't, you know, the, the right alarms don't go off to set in motion the learning process that a good vaccine would trigger. So what we do is we avail ourselves of some cheats. And the cheats are what are called adjuvants. Adjuvants are basically um, irritants for the immune system. So if we give you a bunch of antigen that looks like a pathogen, right? Let's say it's killed virus. 
and we give you an irritant that causes your immune system to wake up and look around, then it can find those, uh, those antigens and it can learn the formula, right? So this is, in my opinion, not a very good way to make a vaccine in part. And, you know, this is largely something I became aware of as I started digging deeper on vaccines during COVID, that the adjuvant mechanism, it may work to trigger a, a natural immunity um, but it may also cause you to become allergic to things, right? We're irritating your immune system and it may find the antigen that we've injected you with, but it may also find the peanuts in your gut or the honey or the gluten or whatever, and it may become sensitive to that. And so there's a question about how many of these uh, new allergic effects that we have where people become allergic to their food and things are actually the result of adjuvanted vaccines. I don't know the answer to that question, but I certainly think it's an important one. All right, so that's the basics of how normal vaccines against a virus would work. When they announced these COVID vaccines, they came in two forms, both of which were totally novel. One of them are the mRNA-based vaccines. And I cannot emphasize enough how... Uh, simultaneously brilliant and diabolical this mechanism is. What, what it does is it takes an mRNA message, the little m in front of the uh, acronym RNA, is, it stands for messenger. Now, messenger RNA is the language that the genes in your nucleus of all of your cells use to get proteins produced, which are what does the work of the cells. Proteins are the working molecules. DNA is the information molecule. mRNA is the intermediary. So a gene is translated into mRNA, or it is uh, transcribed into mRNA and then translated into protein in the cytoplasm of the cell. So what the mRNAs that we injected people with do is they find their way into cells through a mechanism I'll tell you about in a second, and then the natural process inside the cells translates them into proteins, in the case of the vaccines that uh, people were given, into spike protein. That spike protein is supposed to get exported to the surface of the cell where the immune system is supposed to see it and learn the code. Now, on the one hand, that is a very clever way, not really of vaccinating you, but of turning your own cells into vaccine factories, right? It's a totally novel mechanism. It's not an adjuvanted uh, vaccine. It's not an attenuated vaccine. It's a whole new way of doing this. And on the one hand, it solves a problem that accompanies any gene therapy. And there is a strong argument to be made that these are gene therapy Vaccine is the wrong term. Gene therapy is arguably the right one. But when you introduce these mRNAs into cells, there are two things you need to know. One of them took a long time to find out, and the other one was obvious from the get-go, or should have been. The one that's obvious is when your cells start producing a foreign protein, like the spike protein, the immune system cannot help but regard those cells as virally infected. That's the only thing in nature that looks like a cell that has been hijacked by an mRNA vaccine, right? Brett, if I may just stop you there for one second, just make sure I understand. So the mRNA goes into the nucleus or nope. that, not that, um, what does it go into? It goes into the cytoplasm of the cell. Okay. And that triggers the, the, um, production of the protein. Is that what we're calling the spike protein? Yes. So okay. there's a, there's an ancient machine in all of your cells called a ribosome, right? It actually looks like an enzyme or a series of enzymes, but it's made out of RNA, a different kind of RNA. It's not an mRNA, but anyway, it's a big machine that sits around, you know, billions, trillions of these things exist in your body. So anytime an mRNA message finds its way to a ribosome, the ribosome just automatically translates it into protein. In this case, so the question really is, you could effectively put any protein into the body by 
putting it in an mRNA message and then letting the ribosomes produce the protein, right? That's brilliant. There's a lot of stuff that could be usefully done with this mechanism because it allows you to just effectively produce proteins inside of cells, right? But the problem, there are two problems, one of which I was explaining a second ago, which is as soon as your cell starts expressing a foreign protein, your immune system has to think that's a virally infected cell. And there's only one right thing to do with a virally infected cell, and that is destroy it. Okay. If that cell is in your deltoid because they injected this vaccine into your arm and the vaccine stayed where it was supposed to be, then the destruction of that cell in your arm isn't a particularly terrible thing, right? It may give you some weakness, but it's not critical. If, on the other hand, that mRNA has circulated around your body because either they didn't aspirate the syringe when they injected you and they hit a, a vein, or it has leaked out of the deltoid and found its way into lymph and or the blood circulation system, then it could in principle show up anywhere. And that means it could be absorbed by any cell in your body that will have it, which presumably is almost any cell because the mechanism that gets the mRNA into the cells is a chemical affinity between the lipid nanoparticles that they coated it in and the lipids on the surface of cells. All of your cells are coated in lipid. So here's the upshot of this half of the problem. Your cells that take up this message and translate it into protein are going to be targeted by your immune system. When they are targeted, they will be destroyed. If that happens in your arm, it's not a big deal. If it happens in your liver, it's probably not a big deal. If it happens in your heart, it's a huge fucking deal. And they didn't put any targeting mechanism on it. There's nothing about this lipid nanoparticle that says, don't invade heart cells, stick to liver and arm or something like that. There is nothing. So they were depending on these things staying local to the injection site, which they should have known they weren't going to do. And as soon as they found out they weren't doing it, they should have halted the program right then and there because there's no reasonable way that this wasn't going to cause damage to vital organs that you can't afford to have damaged, like, for example, your heart, right? That was obvious or should have been. But that's only half the story. The other half of the story is they told us, and you may even remember that at the early stage of the vaccination campaign, they said that the mRNAs were short-lived so that all of us folks who were upset or concerned by what we were being told about the novelty of this mechanism were overreacting because the mRNAs were um, so short-lived that whatever was going to happen, it wasn't going to be much of it. Well, it turned out that they used a trick to stabilize the mRNAs. And the trick is one that they borrowed from nature. It's something called a pseudouridine, which is, so mRNAs are written in a four-letter code, just like DNA. One of the um, four letters is U for uracil. That's the chemical uh, that uh, is when we describe it on paper, we write a U, but uracil is one of the four chemicals in the alphabet of mRNA. And if you substitute pseudouridine in for a uracil, it makes the mRNA much more stable. Nature does that occasionally. We do not really understand why, where it happens, but there are times when nature wishes to stabilize an mRNA so it is not quickly degraded, and it will do this trick. But the people who made these vaccines stabilized the entire message. They substituted every, uh, every uracil with a pseudouridine, and they made an incredibly stable molecule. So now you've got two problems. One is that you've got... Um, an mRNA with no targeting mechanism being taken up by whatever cells it encounters is circulating around the body. Some of those cells will be heart in the worst case, right? Gets into those heart cells. Those heart cells will translate a protein that will cause the immune system to attack those cells. Those cells will be destroyed. Now you've got a problem that you're not supposed to have, right? Dead tissue in your heart. That's bad because the heart has an extremely low capacity for repair. Mostly what it does is scar, it does not repair. So, okay, now that cell has been destroyed. 
the mRNA has been hyperstabilized and it now spills out of that cell and it presumably gets picked up by another cell. Maybe that cell is a macrophage, another immune cell. That cell picks it up, it's hyperstabilized. Maybe that immune cell now starts translating this protein and it gets targeted by the immune system. So there are two problems. One, it's not targeted and two, um, the hyperstabilizing of the mRNA means that this can continue to cascade into pathologies in cells downstream of the initial transfection event uh, in a way that the architects presumably did not intend.